it definitely breaks the record uh, okay. for our D10 lectures. Okay. Uh, I, in fact, thought of moving it to a much larger auditorium, but this is a traditional RT10 location okay. for this <laughs> auditorium. Okay. And so therefore, we're going to stay here. In fact, Professor Boyd is very much used to crowds of this size when he teaches classes at Stanford. He was on Thursday uh, when he flew here. He actually taught an undergraduate course to freshmen and sophomores on linear algebra, which is a, a very unique approach to linear algebra, introducing students to different applications of linear algebra at a very early stage. And, and I'm sure he'll have the, the class notes of this, uh, as he always does, uh, on his website, which yeah. will be publicly available, and he's also working on that. I wanted to sort of parenthetically uh, uh, say that because uh, he is a, a someone who has contributed both to education as well as research, and education of course for undergraduate and, and graduate level. He's a Samsung uh, professor of in the School of Engineering at, at Stanford, and, and he is also with, uh, he is with the electrical uh, engineering department, and he was the director of the information systems lab uh, in that department, and, and, and he's going to be the department chair actually starting in, in January. And, and he has courtesy appointments also at the Department of Management Science and Engineering, as well as the Department of Computer Science. And he has a degree, undergraduate degree in math from Harvard, and uh, undergraduate degree with the PhD from Berkeley in uh, uh, GEC, electrical engineers and computer science. Well, he's a household name, actually, uh, for those who work in optimization. Uh, he has gained worldwide recognition for his pioneering research uh, uh, in this area, and, and it has revolutionized the conception and application of convex optimization. And, and today's talk, of course, the title of the uh, lecture is, is Convex Optimization. And, and he has applied it to many different areas. And, and in fact, the kinds of problems that he has worked on uh, spans the entire gamut of research and more that we conduct here at CSL. And, and, and that's why I'm not surprised that, that we have such a big audience here. Uh, he has uh, shown that a large number of analysis, design, and control problems admit convex optimization formulation, often with the special structure of semi-definite programs or linear matrix inequality. And we'll hear uh, a lot more about that uh, today. Now, the problems to which he has contributed include, and I have a uh, a list here, a short list, uh, and there are actually more areas than, than, than what I can in this limited introduction uh, transcribe. A, a very wide variety of linear control systems, control design problems, for example, with mixed time and frequency domain constraints and optimal co-design of feedback and heat flow associated applications to nonlinear systems, systems with yeah. delays, and systems yeah. with a variety of transmission designs, signal processing, uh, filter design and deforming, circuit design with another area, for example, analog, digital, and mixed signal circuit patterns, social networks, more, more recent work in this, uh, uh, in this millennium, and, uh, and consensus models, and, and we have several of our students who work on uh, expansions of this, of this uh, uh, revolutionary work in that area, and, and selected other fields such as finance. And uh, he has also developed several widely used open source software packages, including XP, the, the first widely used semi-programming folder. I'm sure uh, several of you are using that uh, package. And SOCP, the, the first widely used second order cold program folder, as well as others. His open source uh, source software package, DDS, 
was revolutionized, the formulation was revolutionized from what happened years ago. He has natural ways to uh, uh, mimic a high level of war criminal coalition. And let me just cite a, a few. Uh, the, on the education side, he has received the HR Teacher uh, Education, Robert Dino Education Award. And from the IEEE, he has received the uh, James Morgan Junior Education Medal. Uh, on the research side, uh, from the IEEE, uh, he has received the Consortium Free Spirit Award, and, and he was also elected to the National Defense Board in Geneva. He's a fellow of IEEE What's and, and, and Intron, and, and he also holds uh, honorary doctors from the two school institutions, the Royal Institute of Technology, which is the ETH, and the Catholic University of Geneva. So please join me in uh, welcoming Steve Boyd to deliver the Great. Ah. Yeah, thank you very much. Good. Go ahead and. Uh, so, uh, I, do, I feel bad about all the people in the second or the third row. So, if you'd like to, come on down. Uh, we, have a, we have room for another row. It's not fire marshal approved, but it <laughs> should be okay as long as the fire marshal doesn't come. So, if, uh, if you want to come around, just now's the time to do it. So, yeah, it's safe. And it'll be safe here. Don't worry. Okay, it's fine. Okay. It's, it's not like sitting in the, you know, the the first row of one of those killer whale shows or something where you're, you're going to get wet or something, right? So, okay, yeah. You can come here. It's okay. It's fine. It's fine. We'll, we'll, I, I need just a little bit of working room, and then we're just doing, we got plenty more. That, that, good. Okay, there we go. All right. Good. Okay. So, th thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I will, uh, I'm going to talk today. It's going to be a very high-level overview. So, uh, if you know anything about some of the topics I'm going to talk about, I know there are people here who do, uh, you're going to be very disappointed because uh, it's because it's going to be at such a high level that, you know, but maybe the ideas will, 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 will come out. So, but just to set your expectations, it's going to be at a very, very high level. Um, so what we're going to do first is I'm going to start and just talk about optimization. And we're actually going to spend like five or ten minutes, weirdly, talking at a super high level about why on earth would you do Optimization. What is it, and why would you do it? Uh, and that'll be that'll be no equations, nothing. So we're just going to talk about it. Um, so, uh, all right, I lied. There were some equations. <laughs> fine, whatever. All right. After this, there's no equations. Fine, fine. Okay. So, uh, all right. So here's an optimization, pro a mathematical optimization problem. So you have a variable uh, 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 that you need to choose the values of it, and uh, you have a you have some uh, constraints, and these are things you're not, you're not willing to accept anything that violates the constraints. Okay? These could be uh, require, hard requirements. And then you have an objective, and we're going to choose to minimize it. Uh, you could uh, also maximize it. You could have multiple objectives. And the truth is, if you know how to solve this problem, then you know how to maximize something. You could minimize the negative of it. And multiple objectives also uh, is easy to do. Once you understand how to solve a single one, uh, you can combine them and then tra you know, sweep out a trade-off curve or something like that. So that's an optimization problem. Okay. So uh, now I'm going to talk, and now there won't be any equations for a little while, but the question is, that why, what would you do with this? Well, okay, so the most obvious thing is this, is this variable x represents an action, right? Like something you actually do. Like, for example, it could be trades at a hedge fund. Okay, so, and you would like to know what trades should I make. Um, it could be control, and X represents the, at the, the control surface deflections, or how are you going to either you know, put your thrust up or down or whatever, something like that. Um, this could be a scheduler assignment. It could be a data center, and you decide uh, to ship a bunch of jobs one place or another to allocate uh, power, uh, you know, cores, whatever you like, to one thing or another. That could be uh, a scheduler assignment problem. It could be resource allocation, same story. Um, or it could be a transmitted signal, like a wireless signal, and X, uh, the XIs are parameters in the signal that you're going to uh, transmit. Okay. Um, now the constraints here are going to limit the actions or impose conditions on the outcome. Right. So, uh, for example, in trading, some trades might be illegal, and so you're not allowed to make them, or something like that. Um, it could impose a condition on the outcome, like for example, that the transmitted signal is received correctly with some probability, or whatever it is, and so on. 
Now, the objective is, uh, is something where the smaller it is, the better. Uh, and it could be, and it's typically something like the total cost or negative profit, right? So either way, it's something like that. Um, it could be a deviation from a desired target or outcome or risk, for example, in a portfolio optimization problem or fuel use or anything like that. So it could be anything that is, a, you know, that's actually a resource that you're using up that's valuable, right? So this is, and this is sort of the, op this is the, op you know, this is the obvious interpretation of what it means to solve an optimization problem. Okay, it's kind of obvious. Okay. Um, but it could also just as well be engineering design. So in that wide context, I mean, and these are not disjoint. I mean, the, the boundaries between these things are quite gray. Um, so there, this variable represents the design. For example, it could be the width and length of all the transistors in your circuit, or the uh, scale factor on the gates in a, in a digital circuit. Or it could be the cross-sectional area in a, a, a space frame uh, for a steel building, you know, for a, build, a steel building, you know, building frame or a bridge or something like that. Um, and so there, X represents, you know, the, some kind of a design. And the constraints come from manufacturing process, of course. There's things, you can either make, not make things too big or too small. Um, and performance requirements, right? So for example, you'd say, I don't want the building to deflect too much with the following sets of loads or whatever it is, right? Um, and then the objective is usually some combination of like cost, weight, power, these kinds of things, Tip, uh, typically in something like this, right? So that would be the, the that's engineering design. This is act these are, of course, actions, but they're actions on a different time scale. The actions I was talking about before might be by the hour, by the day, by the second. And these are actions on the order of every two years, right, if you think about an electronic design. Uh, or if it's a steel frame structure, it's, a, it's, a, it's got a 30-year time period on it. Okay. Now, you can also use optimization um, in a very, very different way, and this is a huge number of fields. Um, and that's where X does not represent actions. It has nothing to do with actions. These, the components of X are parameters in a model. And so this is actually the dominant paradigm in you know, statistics, machine learning, AI. So this is what you have parameters in a model. Um, and the constraints uh, impose requirements on the model parameters. So for example, if, if what you're doing is you're estimating a covariance matrix, the covariance matrix should be positive semi-definite, right? If you're estimating uh, power or fluxes or the amount emitted of something, then that it's going to have to be non-negative. Um, and the objective is actually a combination universally of two things. The first is something which is a prediction error. It's how well does your model fit the data you have, your training data. That's the first part. And the second part is something that penalizes your model being complex. Okay? And what I just described, I mean, it, there's nothing you can say about it, but that happens to be essentially most of machine learning, statistics, and so on. It's just simple beta fitting, right? But again, that's optimization. And the XIs there don't represent actions. They represent parameters in a model. And the objective is something different as well. OK. Inversion, uh, this is actually a variation on uh, fitting a good model. Uh, but it's where the, the typical setup there, and you'll hear usually the word is inversion or something like that. And basically, X is something you want to estimate or reconstruct given a measurement. You know? So for example, it could be you want to reconstruct a 3D picture of uh, the under the ground, uh, the density. Because you want to know if there's an oil, you know, if there's a gas pocket there or whatever there is or a water pocket, whatever it is, something like that. Um, and your measurement might be, you might have flown something over it and got magnetic anomaly uh, measurements or something like that. So that's the, that's the idea there. Um, X could be, Y could be, X could be an actual, uh, you know, something like the density. If you're doing medical imaging, it could be the actual density of something you're interested in, 3D. And then Y would be a bunch of measurements, maybe from an MRI machine or, you know, CT or something like that. Okay. Now, the constraints come from prior knowledge about X. Uh, for example, it's non-negative or something. And the objective, again, here measures deviation between the predicted and actual measurements. So, okay. So, it's, it's very much like data fitting. Except that here, instead of the, you know, the parameters are actually usually have an interpretation as a physical thing, like the density of this voxel. So that's, that's kind of the idea here. Um, by the way, this is, in, I mean, in my opinion, it's simply the correct way to handle uh, inversion, right? When you have an inversion problem, you should set it up as an optimization problem. Actually, not because it has to be an optimization problem, but because it's a way to be very clear about what it is you want to do. So that's actually a good, uh, a, a good reason to do it. Okay, 
I'll talk about a couple of less obvious ones. Here's one. Worst case analysis is optimization. And so this is uh, a friend of mine, Stephen Johnson at MIT, called this uh, pessimization, which I think is a good, a good term. It's kind of it's weird, right? No, basically, the, well, you think about optimization, it sounds like your job, and certainly in all the other applications I just talked about, they're not applications, they're broad, broad categories, you want to do something to make something good. You want a good model, you want a good engineering design, or you want uh, good control performance or something, right? In this case, actually, the objective is to make it as bad as possible. So you do that. Um, and here, the idea is the variables, these are actions or parameters that are out of your control. In fact, implicitly, you're actually pretending they're under, they're actually under the control of an adversary, right? So that's, that's the idea. And so you do this. What you do now is when you solve the optimization problem, what you're doing is you're trying to find the worst thing that could possibly happen. Then the idea of is if the worst thing is not so bad, you feel better, I guess, or whatever, right? <laughs> now, usually what happens is the worst thing is truly terrible. And then you come back and you just simply adjust the constraints so that then you can sleep again or whatever. I mean, because, you know, so, so this would be an example here. So the example would be you're running a hedge fund, and then someone says you make some, uh, you make some assumptions. These are the constraints about what's the worst thing that could happen. And then you find out what's, what's the worst thing that can happen. And, you know, it'll probably be very bad, right? <laughs> so that's the idea. Okay. So uh, this is actually quite useful. Um, uh, I should say what's ac the way this actually works in a lot of, like practical day-to-day -day engineering is you come up to someone and you say, how do you know this works? And they go, oh, we have exhaustively, we've done exhaustive simulations. And you go, oh, really? And they go, oh, yeah. So we've simulated this hundreds of millions of times. And you're like, whoa, that's pretty cool. And then you ask, how many parameters do you have that you don't know? And they'd say 50. And then you politely point out that in R50, which is not that many parameters, by the way, but in R50, 100 million parameters is approximately zero. Right? Because you don't know any. I mean, it's a good first test, right? That it followed, that it worked on those. That's great, but it doesn't tell you anything. But anyway, so, okay. This is a more organized way. In this case, you're not just randomly making parameter, you know, parameter values hoping to find something bad. Well, you're not hoping. That's the wrong word. Um, <laughs> so, in this case, you're actually seeking out bad values. Okay. Um, the last category I want to talk about is optimization based models. So, these are implicit in entire fields. But I want to say something about it because actually at a very high level, it's, it's a very good thing to know about and to think about it this weird, super high level of abstraction. It's this. Um, in optimization-based models, you model an entity as taking actions that solve an optimization problem even though you know that is nonsense. Okay? So here's an example. Uh, well, economics. Okay? So there's an example. You, we're going to say, I'm going to model you know, uh, 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 the actions of an agent uh, as maximizing some expected utility. But if you ask somebody, what are you doing? They're, not, they're like, well, first of all, I don't know what maximization means. I don't know what expected means. I don't know what utility means. I'm buying a car, and please don't bother me. Okay? <laughs> so the point is, you know, this is not, that's not what people are doing. Um, however, it turns out, uh, I mean, there's many ex other examples, right? So, for example, in ecology, you'd say it's that an organism will act to maximize its reproductive success. I mean, that's nonsense. An organism acts it's like biology. That's actually what's happening, right? Um, or uh, there's a big deal now in biology. People do flux-based analysis, where you simply look at you know, a relatively small number of metabolites, and you look at the, the reaction rates and things like that. I mean, it's, almost, it's childish. And you make a prediction as to whether a cell is going to grow or not if you knock out some genes or whatever. And shock, it, it's complete nonsense. Cells are really complicated. What's happening in the cell is called biology or chemistry. That's what's actually happening. It's really complicated. And these things are making actually reasonable predictions. I mean, like quite good, shocking predictions, right? So, so it's just something to think about, uh, that, that this is a whole category of things. And, and it's, it's actually, if you're, mo if you're going into it, if you say to someone else, I'm going to model this as optimizing that, and they start laughing, that's a good sign. It means you're... You're, you're in the spirit of these things, right? It's, it means it's a, a model that's unbelievably laughable. But don't make too much fun of them because they historically have an amazing, uh, an amazing success rate, right? Um, I mean, so it's, it's weird. These are very crude. Yeah, I mean, this works. Now, some, by the way, there is a connection that goes back to physics where it's actually true and correct, right? So a lot of physics, some of you may know, um, is expressed as variational inequalities and things like that, right? So, you know, in electricity and in... in uh, in mechanics, it's the same thing, right? So, um, but it is weird, right? Because if you say to someone, 
does a steel frame building solve a linear program before deciding whether it should collapse or not? It sounds kind of stupid that way, right? Uh, it turns out it makes exquisite predictions, right? In that case, it's correct. But in the others, th these are just ridiculous models, these three, right? So, okay. So, here's a summary. Uh, optimization comes up everywhere. I mean, like, just ev like cross, not just fields, but like meta fields, right? So, um, okay, that's great. And then the bad news, you can't solve any of them. So that's the, that's the really bad news. Now, ah, well, whatever. So, uh, okay, so that, there's two approaches to this. Uh, one is you don't care, it's no problem, and you just move on. And that's just fine. And by the way, there's nothing, shouldn't make fun of that, uh, for example. Uh, you know, people who tune deep neural nets, they have, there's, an ob there's an objective function. They, they attempt to minimize it. A GPU runs for a week. This is the way this works, right? Looks at a whole lot of pictures from the internet or whatever. Out, it tunes a million parameters. Um, and actually, they don't care that they haven't minimized their objective function. They know well that they have not, right? Uh, what all they care about is if they take this, this, this network with these million, this choice of million parameters, and they try it on new data, it'll identify the cat faces. And if they can do that, they're happy, okay? So, and by the way, it does that. Yeah. By the way, I wouldn't laugh too hard because this is coming to your field pretty soon. So just, <laughs> so just, 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 a, little, just a little heads up there. Uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, you'll start having nightmares of cat faces. Uh, that's, that's fine. Okay, now there are some exceptions, right? Uh, so uh, here's, a, here's a broad ex exception. This is what I'm gonna talk about is Convex optimization, basically they're tractable. You can solve them, okay? So that's what they are. I mean, but let's not over, I mean, some people say, oh, well, if it's not convex, you, it's just a heuristic. Yeah, it's heuristic, but let's remember a lot of heuristics work like really well. Uh, not to mention the heuristics I was just talking about, which will be coming to your field soon, okay? If it's not already there, um, okay. So, but the point is, if you can solve a problem exactly, then well, why not, okay? So. That's the, so that's actually what convex optimization is. It's, a, it's just a subclass of problems that you can solve exactly, right? So, okay. So here's what it looks like. Um, actually, there's only a couple of constraints. The, the, uh, the equality constraints have to be linear. The inequality have to be, I'm gonna put them as less than or equal to zero. And the objective, they have to have non-negative curvature. So that's, that's actually the only requirement. It has to curve up, that's it. So, by the way, they can have zero curvature, which means that they are, uh, affine, they're linear plus a constant, that's zero curvature. But, um, and that's the, uh, that's what a convex optimization problem is. And basically, you can solve these, right? So, um, you know, like, why would you want to study it? Well, I don't know, the, the, the math is actually, it's pretty, and that's great, right? Uh, so you get all sorts of interesting stuff, and this is worth learning. Um, but I'll go sort of in, in increasing order. It's completely subjective, my list of why you would be interested. Um, but more, I mean, the math is beautiful, but the, the really cool part is they're actually algorithms that work uh, in theory and practice. Probably more important, in my opinion, that they work in practice. Um, and you actually really solve the problem. You really, you really get the, you get an X that has minimum objective subject to the constraints, period. Um, and you get a certificate showing it. Um, so one cool thing is it is, it gives you a conceptual unification of a lot of methods, right? So. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's fun. I mean, I teach a class on this. So it's a big class, and we have people from 30 departments in the class, right? So, and it's, it's actually just fun socially because, you know, someone you're sitting in the class, and you do image processing, and the person next to you is a geneticist, and the person on your right is a circuit designer. So, I mean, it's cool. It's fun. It's it just, you know, th th they're all in the same class. Um, okay, so that's actually, like, quite, uh, that, that's actually a very nice thing, right? Um, here would be an example. If you look at machine learning, uh, so, if you look at the course, you know, the first seven weeks of the class, usually, you know, it starts with, okay, here's like regression, and here's lasso, and here's, I don't know, support vector machine, and logistic, all these things. And then, and nowadays, you simply, instead of like giving you a separate thing for each of these, you just say, well, they're just all convex. That's the way it works. So, and, and that's actually how it's done at, at Stanford anyway. Okay. So, okay. But here's the main reason. Is that it's just tons of applications, right? So it's it's fun, and we'll talk a little bit about the applications and, and how it's used, and I'll say a little bit about that. Um, but the areas would be things like, I mean, it's all throughout machine learning and statistics. Um, uh, oh, 
I should say uh, there's very interesting things going on right now uh, with the uh, with the hordes uh, and their neural network, you know, laying siege to the statistics department. Anyway, so we'll we'll talk about that later. Uh, but uh, okay, um, finance it ever goes throughout finance. Uh, you could even say that most of most of what you know, sort of classical Western economics is based on it because it's all based on this no arbitrage idea, and that's a straight duality. So, okay, it it runs supply chain, revenue management, advertising, control. It's everywhere. Signal and image processing and vision. Um, networking, circuit design, combinatorial optimization, you can't solve them, but the, all the methods for doing this rely as convex optimization on, as a subroutine, and it comes up in a lot of other things. This is the flux-based analysis in biology that I, I mentioned earlier. So, okay. Uh, now, probably you'll know that some of these things have now been uh, visited uh, by our, our, our neural network friends. Which, uh, by the way, they really are my friends. It, it, I know it doesn't sound like it, but they are. Uh, and, you know, more will be, and uh, maybe at the end we'll talk a little bit about well, how this should all work together, but okay. So here's the approach. The approach is you try to formulate your problem as convex. Now, sometimes that just happens. Someone wa runs up to you on the street, and this happens to me. I go somewhere and they go, oh, now here's my problem, I have this and that, and you want to choose these things and those things and that, and you have to limit this, and, th and it's just convex and it's done. Okay, so that's, that's it. Now, the general rule here is if you succeed, you can usually solve it numerically. I'll talk a little bit about that later, right? So that's the rule. Uh, if, if it doesn't work with just generic tools, then I'm aware of no application where someone wanted to solve a problem and they couldn't do it. And I'm talking about problems that range up to billions of variables and things like that. If people want to do it, they'll figure out a way. So that's, I don't know of any exceptions to that. Um, now, there are some tricks. So. This is sort of the clean, that's the clean stuff that we teach in the, in the class. A little bit we hint at what we call streak fighting convex optimization. And it's not pretty, uh, but it's actually will, it, it actually makes people unbelievably effective. Like unbelievably, I mean, if you go, I mean, and I'm talking about in any sort of practical thing. Uh, they're, they actually usually cannot be beat, right? So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So, you know, you could change variables, and there's some famous cases where this renders, a, makes a problem go from non-convex to convex. Some circuit design, and it turns out, instead of working with the lengths and widths, you should work with the logs of the lengths and widths, and it turns out circuit designers have kind of known this by intuition for decades. I mean, that's why when you look at a library of devices, you'll find the gates come in, in sizes like 1, 1 1.4, 2, 2.8, you know, 4. I mean, they, they've known this, okay? Um, but then there's this. So when you get really advanced at street fighting, uh, if you can do something actually goes like this, uh, it's pretty severe. What, here's, here's the approach to a constraint, for example, that you can't handle. You just ignore it. <laughs> you just ignore it. Um, and by the way, I mean, if you think it's a, if something is supposed to be uh, like a zero one variable, like you know you have you assign something to that or not, you just make it a real variable between zero and one. You solve the problem, and then the first thing you do is you, tr you go back to whoever posed the problem, and you try to explain that this is more sophisticated than the original problem. <laughs> and you, so you mention things like, oh, you don't understand. This is more, you'll, yeah, sure, you said I should, I should assign one anesthesiologist to each case. Oh, sure, sure. But this is more like a quantum mechanical thing. <laughs> and and they're, they're saying, I'm sorry, you cannot, we cannot assign 0.63 of an anesthesiologist to a surgery. I'm sorry. And, okay, so, but, but the point is, that's worth a try. It's always worth a try in any application, right? Then the simple thing is you round or something, and there's usually things this works very well. This is, by the way, sometimes dressed up and, and made to look super, I, can, I could make this look so sophisticated. I could come in and say, <laughs> we're going to do semi-definite relaxation on your hospital assignment problem, and I would look super fancy. And if I didn't like cr start laughing at any point, you would even fall for it for sure. So, so, so. By the way, I would. That's a good technique to know about, right? So you should. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So. Okay. Um, so. So the point here is that this is the clean stuff, and we just have a single metric here. And the question is, when you use convex optimization in practice, the question is this: Is what's the level of violence needed? to make your problem submit. Um, and sometimes it's just a little bit. And sometimes it's a little more. And then sometimes it's quite severe, like that. Yeah, so, so, but that's fine. That's the way it works. Yeah, okay. So, all right. So let's look at some examples quickly. Um, 
So we'll do radiation treatment planning. We're just gonna, I'm just going to show you a couple of things, right? So uh, very high level. So I am going to, I have a, a patient with a, a tumor uh, that is uh, not where the surgeons don't want to go in because it's too close to critical structures or something like that. And so what you're going to do is you immobilize the patient and you take a, like actually a linear accelerator and you send uh, very high energy beams through the patient, right? This is not something you would want to do casually, right? But, you know, these are people who, uh, the only other choice is they're going to, I guess they're, they're just going to die, right? So, okay, so you, you do this. And what it is, you can control the intensities of these beams. Those are, those are the Xs. Um, then what happens is the beam goes through the patient. And, of course, it has to do with the geometry, like where's the patient and then where is this, this machine? And then they have these weird lead collimators, and they have, like, shades and all sorts of other crazy stuff. When the beam enters the patient, it hits bone, it scatters, and this is a whole field. But bottom line is it's linear. So the actual, if Y is a big, giant vector of the received dose at the voxel, it's, a line, it's linear. It's Y equals, people, by the way, who do uh, radiation physics get super pissed off when they see this because it's basically that's their whole life. You know, anyway, so, so <laughs> I mean, it's, it's fine. It's actually fine, right? And I say, no, no, this is not, we're not disrespecting, because I would say things like, well, it's just Y equals AX. And, they, they, and I was like, no, 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 that's fine. So, but, but it is. Uh, okay. So, um, okay. And the goal is you want to choose X so that Y uh, is close to some uh, dosage, which is given by a radiation oncologist. And here's a typical, uh, here's a, a prescription, right? Um, on all voxels that are not tumor, here's a prescription. Ready? Zero. I mean, duh. Okay. And then for all voxels that are tumors, I want 50 grays. I don't know. I don't, don't even know what a gray is. I do. It's a, it's a, it's a radiation dosage unit, right? So you want that's what you want. Okay. Now, you can't do this, I mean, duh, because, for example, you have to go through non-tumor cells to get into the tumor. So you know that you're not going to be able to achieve this. So you do this by, by optimization, right? That's, that's the way to do it. I mean, I'm, what I'm telling you is something that, that people have known and actually use. So, okay. So it turns out, here's an example. Um, if you just, this would be a simple model. It turns out, actually, what I know now, because I have my first MD, PhD student, so he's working on this. So uh, it, here's what I know now, is actually, not only is this the simplest model, it's actually complete, it, it works just fine. Like, like clinical level, just fine. So it's just this. You, the plus part says that when this is positive, this, when this is negative, it's zero, right? What's positive is just this thing. And so this is the amount by which you have overdosed that voxel. And you have a weight on it. These are positive, and that's how much you're going to pay. <coughs> this is when you're under, right? Because this says if that's positive, it says that the dose is higher than what you, the, the prescribed dose is higher than what you actually delivered. And so this thing is positive, and you have an underdosing thing. And by just taking reasonable values of these things, you're actually going to get a perfectly good uh, plan, right? Oh, um, this objective here is highly non-differentiable, right? The, the plus function, the hinge function, right? It's got a, a kink in it, right? And this is maybe a good time for me to say that all of the traditional optimization you learned is uh, completely useless, mostly for convex optimization, right? Because if you will recall how that course goes, it starts this way. You start with the gradients, right? And then you say, here's descent method, and then, then you go to the second order thing, and here's Newton's method, and then you say, oh, well, the ma this matrix is too big, and I don't like inverting it, I don't even, I, and then they say, here's quasi-Newton, and then conjugate, I don't know, okay, you know that course? Yeah, so, <laughs> for, sorry if someone here teaches it. Anyway, so, <laughs> it, it, so, all I'm saying is, it, that has its uses, but in convex optimization, it doesn't. Okay, so it's not, it's, it's just not relevant, uh, differentiability and things like that, so, okay. Okay, so here's, a, here's an example. Um, it's a small thing. It's got 360 beams and uh, a third of a million voxels. And uh, that's the actual plan that you end up with. Um, and actually, weirdly, this is a case where it was actually a clinical case. And, and it, it looked, actually looked to me like it was pretty much the same as the clinical case. But the, the person who actually did the case uh, said it was, he merely said it was close. He said, he was, he said it was nice. But close, but his was better. But anyway, so uh, it's okay. Okay, so um, the difference was I think it took them hours to uh, tweak. They were doing weighted least squares, and it took them a long time to get it. And this was on a GPU. This was like about two seconds, right? And then warm starts where you change the weights uh, was at video frame rate, so 30 milliseconds, right? You change the weights, and you get a new design 
uh, 30 milliseconds later. Right? So okay, so okay. Next example. Uh, so that was th that was very much an example in the broad category of good actions, right? Because aiming a high energy beam at a person is very much an action. Okay. So the next one is going to be uh, one of these inversion problems. So in an inversion problem, um, what this is image in painting. It's a very old problem. All these I'm going to tell you about, these are all like relatively old things, but it's just simple examples. Um, and so the idea is you have an image, and then uh, you have RGB and values, but you have a bunch of places where you don't know the values, and your job is to guess the ones that are missing. That's in painting. I mean, it's a good, it's a good term, right? This has been studied by people in uh, image processing for like, I don't know, two and a half decades, right? Oh, and by the way, you could do much better job than what I'm going to show you, but what I want to show you is just how simple it is, right? So, or how, sorry, what I want to show you is you can do shockingly well with something embarrassingly simple. That's what I wanted to say. Okay, so, um, so this is from the 90s. It was suggested uh, that what you should do is minimize the sum of the squares. That's a three vector. And this is the one, you know, that's the pixel to the left and that's the pixel below or something. And so this sixth vector is actually an approximation of the, of the space gradient of the RGB vector. It's, you know, it's the RGB X and Y derivatives, roughly, right? And you should sum up the, the sum of the squares. Uh, sorry, <coughs> sum of the two norms. Uh, I just did it myself. So all of us in this room are trained. In fact, you can even do a test where you'd ask people if I close this up and said, what am I covering? They'll say there was a two. Because we're all trained, when you see a two norm, to square it. And that goes back to Gauss. That's 200 years old, right? So of, cor of course. And then, the, you know, the reason why do you do that and everything, because it converts, I don't know, it converts so you can get an analytical solution, all this stuff, okay? So by the way, if I put a square here, this is the Laplacian of this thing, right? So, but this is very much not squared. And so this is actually like the hinge thing we saw before with the dosing. It's, this is, I mean, this is a cone, right? It's a second order cone, and there's a sharp point. Um, that's actually kind of what you want to do. That's a convex problem, and you can solve it. And so we'll just show you an example here. So this is a problem with about a million variables. It's the inf infamous uh, Lena uh, image. Um, and then we just removed a bunch of pixels, and I, f I forget how many we did, but maybe that's 5% of the pixels are just gone or 10, I don't know what it is, something like that. Okay, and now look, it's not, you know, you can figure out what's going on here, right? I over here it's smooth. Of course you want to fill in that M with RGB values that look like their neighbors. I mean, duh, right? And you could make a pretty simple heuristic that did it. Like, you're at a point, and you go find the nearest neighbor that's known, and you take some average, and okay, whatever. And you would get something, and it would look, it would work really, w it pretty well here. It'd look pretty smooth. Out here, where there's edges, it would not work well at all. You'd, I, you'd be able to read the letters, okay, if you do this. Okay, so, okay, so here it is. That's, uh, that's the recovered one, and that's merely by solving this convex optimization problem, right? So I should say a couple of things. Number one, image processing people can do way better than this now. But the main point here is that that's like shockingly good, like shocking. And you might ask questions like, in this one, are the pixels that have been inpainted, th did they actually match the truth? And the answer is no, they didn't. You know, so that if you take the difference of these two images, you'll see all sorts of stuff. This is wrong. Well, of course, for image pixels that were known, it's not wrong. But for all those things, it's all wrong. Um, what this did is this, this filled in pixel RGB values that are not the truth, but they're ones that to us look natural. Okay? So this is just an example. So, okay. Um, uh, last quick example is uh, support vector machine. So the goal is you want to, probably many of you have seen this, right? So the goal is to predict a Boolean out outcome from a set of N features like a spam filter, fraud detection. Just is, a, is someone... Is someone going to purchase something? That's your prediction. And you're going to make it a ba based on attributes of, let's say, the person and the product. And maybe other stuff, like what time is it and blah, blah, blah. OK, so all right. And so you'd have a bunch of data. And that would be these big vectors of attributes. And then a Boolean, which is a plus, you know, it's, a, it's plus minus one, meaning they, they, in the past they looked but didn't buy or they bought it or whatever it is. OK, and we're going to make a linear predictor. That's going to look like this. And you're going to choose. Uh, this W and this B. So this is very much a, a data fitting problem. So your objective is going to have two terms here, which is one is one that says, please, please make this thing look like that. And the second one is going to be, I want the model to be simple. And in this case, that's going to translate to W, the vector being small. Okay? So the support vector machine says, here's how you should choose W and V. 
uh, you would have, again, a non-differentiable thing. You'd like these two things to have the same sign. But more than that, you'd actually like them both to be bigger. I mean, this thing could be plus or minus 1, right? So you want this to be bigger than 1. That's the margin. And you'd say you'll, you'll start charging when that's less than 1. And then over here, this is w should be small. And lambda is a parameter that you vary. And you get different models. And then you check them by cross-validation to figure out what value lambda should have. OK, so uh, that's a convex function here. So you just minimize. It's non-differentiable. You can see from the subplus. And you just minimize it. OK. And the picture would be something like this, right? That you'd have, I mean, this is stupid because if you have two features, the way you make a classifier is you get out a pencil and you draw some curve, and that's it, right? Or if they're all intermingled, you just say, no, I'm quitting, I'm, or I'm going to lunch. Forget it. I mean, it's not going to work, right? So I mean, the point is, it's, this is just to illustrate, right? The main point is that the same method works with 200 parameters or 20,000 or uh, billions, which are actually what people feel often. Right, so, OK. Um, and now I'll mention something uh, pretty basic. It's about, um, it's a very interesting thing from in optimization, in convex optimization. From the, it goes back at least 20 years, but actually probably longer if you really look into it. And the idea is like actually kind of simple, and it goes like this. It says that if you add a multiple of the sum of the absolute values there, now notice that we're all trained to want to add the sum of the, the xi squared, because then you get something smooth, and sometimes you can solve it analytically, and blah, blah, blah. This says, no, I want to add the sum of the absolute values. Okay, uh, And when you add that and solve the problem, you often get that many of the entries of x are 0. Okay, so, th so the cool part is this preserves convexity, and it, therefore it's tractable. And this has been used for a gazillion years. Uh, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, it's been made famous in some quarters uh, by you know, calling this compressed sensing and make it, making it sound fancier than it is. Okay? Uh, actually, the total variation reconstruction we just saw, same thing. It's actually sparsity of the space gradient, same thing. Um, it's used in, uh, in machine learning to do feature selection. It's used for sparse design, too. Right? So there, for example, when you design a, a steel frame structure, you might say, well, I'm going to design it, and I'm going to take, I'm going to have a million bars. A bar connects one node to another. You have no intention of building a building or a space frame with a million bars. You add a regularization like this, you solve, and, it'll, and out of the million bars, it'll choose 238. And you'd say, there's my, I just designed the topology of my structure, right? Because it shows which ones, the vast majority of them were zero, you never intended to build them anyway. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. Okay. Um, so I'll give you an example. It's a fun example. Historically, it's perfect because it, it starts with least squares. So that's the oldest convex optimization problem there is. This is from Gauss 200 years ago, or Legendre, or, uh, or Legendre. It depends on who you ask, right? And then, then we add this thing, which is you know maybe from the last 10 years, maybe 20, 30, depending on how you do your history. OK, um, but here's the cool part. Um, this is useful when n is bigger than m. That means that a is wide, and that means you have more parameters. d, the height of a, is actually the number of measurements or data points you have. And the width of A is the number of parameters in your model, right? So normal statistics goes like this. I walk up down the street and I say, oh, please fit a model. And you go, OK, sure. Uh, and you'd say, uh, you know, how, they'd say to you, how many parameters, you know, how, many, how much data do you have? You say, oh, I have 300 samples. I have 300 points. And you go, how many, pr many parameters in your model? And they'd say five. Or they'd say 10 or 20. And then you might start getting nervous. But if they said I have 3,000 parameters in my model, it'd be weird. Yeah, because you only have 300 data points or whatever I said it was, right? So, okay, so, but this is actually, this is widely used in this case, right? So, okay. Now, the, the classical analog of this is called ridge regression, where you indeed take this and make it the sum of the squares, right? So that, that's been done for, you know, 50 years or maybe more. Okay, so here's something weird. Um, this isn't, this is taught, uh, and this isn't taught. Uh, it is now in advanced courses that are getting less advanced every, you know, every year. But um, this is not, <laughs> no, just because people are getting used to it, right? This is taught. And a lot of this has to do with intellectual snobbery because there is an analytical formula for this. You know, it's like A transpose A plus lambda I inverse A transpose B or something like that, right? Actually, that was right. So, <laughs> so the point is, you know, that, and it's clean, and you can prove things about it, and, you know, if you're in statistics, you can talk about asymptotic distributions of that, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And you can't do it here. There's no analytical formula for that, but it's a convex problem. And you might say, and people did say, they'd say, 
oh, no, 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 we, you've got, you're missing belief. We do this because it's tractable, and that's, that's much harder, right? It turns out that's just a big old lie. It turns out it's just not true. It's just they're the same, com it's the same complexity. I mean, it could be a factor of two or so, or maybe some, it's not even really in these things. Okay, so we do a quick example. Um, so here, uh, I'm going to give you 200 measurements of 1,000 things. I mean, so you're, that means you're, I'm giving you one-fifth of what I should get, I, the minimum number I could give you to actually reconstruct the things. So I'm going to tell you that the true x is sparse. And I'm going to say, it, I mean, it happens to have 30 non-zeros. Now, that would be reasonable if I said, fit a model with 30 parameters, I'm giving you 200 noisy things. You know, that's fine. We know what to do. Um, but 1,000, you don't. Um, and so if you do the ridge regression, you get the thing on the right, which, of course. And then when you do uh, the lasso reconstruction, you get that. Okay? So um, that maybe a bunch of you have seen this. I assume some have. Um, if you haven't and you're not impressed, uh, you should be – I mean, think carefully about what's just been done. It's kind of ridiculous. It's right – basically, I ask you to, to, to fit 1,000 parameters, giving you 200 data points, and you did it. Right, so you were you were one fifth under critical sampling or whatever you want to call it. Right, so um, it's it's uh, it's kind of crazy. Um, by the way, the younger grad students, people who work in this area, they get used to this completely. And I I'd show things like this, and they go, Yeah, sure, duh, everybody. <laughs> and you're like, I said, Do you understand what's happening here? And they're like, Oh yeah, everybody knows that. And I'm like, No, like everybody in the last eight years knows that. But this is kind of amazing. And they're like, Yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> so, okay, so. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit of how to solve these things. Um, so if you have thousands to ten thousands of variables, I mean, this, as long as you don't have like a sup, you know, super tight time limit or something, you can, I can solve this on my laptop. I actually can solve it on my phone. So uh, that's a student did that to me. He said, download this app. I said, okay. And, I, and he said, then press this. It had one button on it. I pressed it. He said, you just solved an SOCP. And I'm like, okay. So, and he goes, no, isn't that cool? And I'm like, uh, okay. So, <laughs> Okay, so these things exploit problem sparsity, and it's not quite a technology, but it's getting there, and actually in areas where you want it to be a technology, it is a technology or can be made a technology. Um, I, I should say something about that. Um, when I give talks, sometimes I give talks to, to optimization people, and this drives them insane. They think this is incredibly insulting, uh, that they go, you're encouraging people to use it as a black box. And I go, oh yeah, that's exactly correct. And they're like, oh, that's so wrong, that's terrible. And I go, and they think it's also an insult. But I tell them, actually, no, that is not, there's no higher praise than that. That's the way I mean it. And what I mean is this. It means, it's, it's, it, it means you've done something that's highly non-trivial. Um, you worked out the theory. You've worked out algorithms. You understand completely how the algorithms work. You have a flawless open source implementation. You wrapped it, and you put a perfect, thin, small, very compact interface. You define the semantics and syntax, and the result is now 10,000 times more people can use it than understand the guts. And when I say it that way, they're still angry at me. But, <laughs> but in my, I, that, for me, that's the highest praise. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the coolest thing ever. Right? So, but I don't know. Some people think you should know everything about all the details of what's happening under the hood. Of course, these people don't. Right? So I, I usually finish the argument by saying, you use TCP IP every day. By the way, they usually don't even know what that is. Right? <laughs> and I would say, okay, well, trust me, you use it. Okay, number one, you use it. You don't even know what it is, right? It's highly non-trivial. It was, it was designed and thought through by super intelligent people who came out with outstanding algorithms. They understand the algorithms. They probably have some kind of proof of correctness. There's perfect, flawless open source implementations. And the result is you and I can use it. And look, you didn't even know you were using it. So, I mean, that, that, by the way, that doesn't make them any less angry. So, okay. Um, okay. So, uh, let me talk a little bit about some, some relatively new things, but like everything that's supposed to be relatively new, it's really not. So these are things that go back, you know, 50 years or, nah, okay, something like that. So it's modeling languages. And this is also uh, important. Actually, this relates to the technology thing, because the idea is you want to, like in computer science, you want to encapsulate things, uh, have a perfect implementation, and export a small interface so that other people can use it. And so a modeling language is that. So you have a high-level language. It's a domain-specific language where you, you declare you know, the variables and things like that. And then you have something like a compiler uh, to translate that into some standard form. Um, and that's the idea. OK. And then so, uh, so this is super useful. I mean, the idea, this goes back 
you know, 40, 50 years for optimization uh, in general. Um, what, one specifically for convex optimization probably go back about 10. Okay, so, um, and it's, it's very nice because it means you can actually rapidly prototype things. I mean, super fast, like five lines and you're actually solving like serious problems. Um, for teaching, it's fantastic. And I know because I taught a class before and after the advent of these things. And before, we'd talk about all these things, but it was a pain in the ass to actually have the students do things because, you know, you didn't want on a homework assignment for them to spend most of their time debugging, you know, uh, calling some stupid linear programming solver, right? Uh, what you really wanted them to do was, was image processing or finance or control or generate a trajectory. That's what you really wanted. And so uh, afterwards, it, it changed everything. I mean, so five lines, so the result is you teach the class now, you take that class, you will not just talk about signal processing, image processing, finance, circuit science, you will actually do it. I mean, and you'll, you'll never write more than a six line script, right? So, okay, so one of these, uh, maybe the first historically is this thing called CBX. Actually, it's not, uh, Yalmuth was, uh, was, was an earlier one. Um, so here's, here's a uh, support vector machine. Here's, you know, here's the latex, the mask. And the idea is you want the, so you want the source code to look like the mask. And if you do that, you got it right. So that's the idea. So, and then, you know, if you read, uh, if you read MATLAB, you know, this is a pretty accurate uh, transcription of that or something. That, that's the idea. Um, so this would be CBX. Um, by the way, uh, for solving a support vector machine, this would be about the worst thing, I mean, it'd be, you could get something that's 100 times faster, or 1,000, depending on the size of the problem. Okay? Actually, that's not true, 100, 100 times faster. Um, but the point is it's not for solving things that already exist, it's for making up a new problem that no one's ever solved before and then implementing it in about 30 seconds. So um, this is very important for grad students, by the way, because usually implementing things, well, not usually, always, it falls to the grad students. The professors just say, oh, I think this would be a good idea, we should minimize this. And then the grad students actually have to go implement this in like C++ or something like that, and it's not fun. And then, by the way, most of the time it doesn't work, right? So, so the point is, for, grad, for professors, this doesn't change a lot of things, except actually you just get a lot more cycles out of a grad student. So actually, uh, what happens is, more than that, uh, actually, what happens is it's so easy, professors can do it. Uh, and that, so just from a... That's weird. I talked to the grad students about that because it's like, you know, there's a little bit of, I mean, it could threaten the job, you know, like, right? It was, it, yeah, the order of the world was the professors wrote stuff on a whiteboard and said, yeah, try this. And then the grad students go implement. But now if a professor can do it, it's like, and I asked the grad students, are you guys nervous? And they were like, not really. No. So they're not, they're not. Anyway, okay. So there's a newer, in the last couple of years, we've been working, my group has been working to make uh, I mean, everything, it's all open source, but it you can't be open source and run on MATLAB, that's stupid, right? So we're actually building out real stuff. So we built solvers that are open source, we built uh, a whole system, and actually not only is it open source, but it's actually way better, because it turns out implementing these things in real language is great. Um, so, and this is just, this is one written in Python, and there's, one, there's uh, a Julia thing, which is even cooler. Um, actually, the cool thing about the Julia one is these languages are so sophisticated that the core in Julia, it's like 40 lines. So, but that's a very powerful language, right? That's one where you grab, you just grab directly the abstract syntax tree for the expressions, and you do various transformations on it, and it's done, 40 lines to make something. So people think, actually, these things are like way more complicated than they are. They're not complicated. Well, they are if you do it in some horrible thing like MATLAB, right? They are not, in a real language, they're much, they're actually quite straightforward, which is good, because actually, it's things that are done in, that are super simple, and, and match the mathematics perfectly, those are the implementations of things that actually generally work. Things that are just giant spaghetti code that says, oh, if you see a max, you should do this. If you see this or that, you should, those are never gonna work. I mean, they'll look like they work, but they're gonna have all sorts of hidden bugs and things like that. So ones that track the math and are 40 lines at their core, they're gonna work. So, okay. All right, so I'm gonna talk about one of these uh, new, I'm gonna change now. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, a, uh, uh, something that's actually more specialized now. Um, and it's, we're gonna talk about actually uh, solving small-ish convex problems super fast on an embedded system, right? And then, depending on the time, I may quit after that, but we'll just see how this goes. So, okay. So the idea is, in a lot of applications, you're gonna solve the same problem over and over again, but with different data, right? So for example, if you're doing control, uh, 
you're solving an optimization problem to decide what torques to send to your robot, uh, your, your, your robot motors, right? And, you know, the, the, uh, things change, like your actual current position, your velocities, uh, even, even high-level goals. Um, in finance, same thing. You solve the same problem. But, of course, you always update with new information, new predictions, new forecasts, all that kind of stuff. Also, your actual current portfolio uh, level. You want to know where you are and stuff like that. Okay. So um, now these require, like, extreme solver reliability. Um, and if it's in control, it's got to be – you have to have hard real-time execution. So you have to be able to say this – in fact, you have, to, you have to be able to, like, count the number of flops or something and say this will execute in, you know, five milliseconds, like, period. So, um, and um, of course, this is used now when the solve times are measured in minutes or hours, right? So supply chains have been running this way for 15 years, 20 years. Um, chemi large chemical process plants have been running this way for like 20 years, right? So they solve a giant, you know, problem with like a bunch of variables and stuff. But that's because they only have to make a decision every 15 minutes. And then I was in control, so, and I can tell you that I, I used to think, the following, if someone said, hey, how come this person over here who works in supply chain management, they solve this incredibly sophisticated problem that takes into account all the queue lengths and the capacities and, and the nonlinear costs. How come they're doing something super sophisticated and all you guys do is multiply by a matrix, right? Which is kind of what control is, right? I mean, that's like, I mean, okay, maybe two matrices, but the point is, <laughs> and I'd say, well, no, sure, that's a, we'd love to do sophisticated things like them, but we can't do that because Number one, we have 10 milliseconds to make that decision, and we can't, we can't mess up, right? 10 milliseconds means 10 milliseconds, period, right? Um, and I'd say, well, you can't solve a big, sophisticated problem in 10 milliseconds. And it turns out that's wrong. I, did, I, didn't, know, I didn't appreciate that. You can. You can solve a complicated optimization problem in 10 milliseconds or a lot faster. So um, and it turns out you can just do this. It's not, uh, it's, it's not – and you actually get weird solve times getting into the milliseconds or microseconds, right? So – um, by the way, this is very cool stuff. Very few people appreciate this um, because it just, it, just, it just messes with a whole lot of fields. A whole lot of things are based on some 1960s or 80s idea of how long it takes to do something. And it just, it just scale Moore's Law in your head and figure out that it's just not – some of these things are just not right anymore. So you can solve a sophisticated optimization problem at 100 hertz or a kilohertz, right? And it's beginning to happen. Uh, so – uh, it hasn't, you know, it's still, it's still propagating. Okay, so I'll just give you a quick example. It's, I have a, uh, I, I have a, 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 some mass, and I want to move it from one place to another, but I'm going to push it so hard, because I'm going to do this in minimum time, I'm going to push it so hard that I'm going to actually excite the vibration dynamics, so I have to model it as like three masses in the spring. Okay, so that's the idea. And, you know, if it was a single mass, everyone knows the solution to this analytically. Um, and these days, you just look at that and say, well, that's convex, and then you're done, right? So um, here would be an example uh, of that thing. We just put unit mass, unit damping, unit stiffness, everything. It's just a simple example. And it turns out it, the minimum is something like seven time units. Well, I don't know what they are. You can make it up, seven milliseconds or something. Um, and then that's the force you should apply, okay? So um, – and the only thing I'm going to say about the force is that no human being could, could figure that out. I mean, some of it is obvious, right? If you want to push a mass this way, of course, first you should push it, and then later you should do some braking, right? But what is all this stuff? I don't know what it is. I mean, you could make a story up afterwards. You could say, oh, yeah, oh, well, no, I can tell you what this is. Here you, you push it so it starts moving in that direction. And in this case, you're removing the energy in the vibration mode, and you're like, okay. <laughs> Everyone see what I'm saying? But the point is, you can't do – I mean, and if you think you can't do this, you sure as hell can't do this. If I've got 14 actuators on it, the state space size is 22, and it's over – I mean, you just can't do it. It's just not you – know, so it's better to just, like, say, okay, we'll just let the optimization do it. So that's uh, – okay. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about, um, about this. Uh, uh, well, it's a while ago now. Okay. So I had a, a student uh, who put together a, um, a prototype of just a code generator. And so the idea is you type – you give a high-level description of the problem in some – in a domain-specific language. Uh, th then that was compiled into flat C. In fact, library free C. The whole thing is compiled. Um, then, you use a, then you use a fancy uh, compiler like GCC minus O2 or so, I don't know, whatever it is. You put some optimization on it. It takes a long time to compile it. And because we generated code that was almost branch free, uh, 
the optimizer would go insane and reorder things and fill pipelines and do, I didn't even know what it did, but it, the result was you get things that come out that are really fast. Now, compared to something written in Python or something that's doing, that's parsing the problem and transforming it and all sorts of crazy stuff is happening, of course it's gonna be 10 times faster, but it turns out it'd be a little bit of a surprise because it's typically 10 to 1,000, 100, 100 to 1,000 or even more times faster. Um, by the way, vast majority of the credit on a log scale goes to my friends who do uh, <coughs> compiler optimization. Not, not, well, okay, we do optimization, but compile, they're the people who, who, generate, who generate optimized code. So they get all the credit. So I, just to say that. By the way, they like it too. They use these now for their examples because <laughs> it makes them look really good. <laughs> so, uh, so um, yeah, but actually a very good thing happened. We fiddled with this and since we knew absolutely Everything we knew, every access, every memory access, every uh, everything going on. So Jacob and I thought, well, we'll be smart. D that means, of course, Jacob, right? But you understood that, okay? So, <laughs> so we sat down. And we thought, well, well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna reorder all the calculations so that the memory access are more local. And we're like, that's awesome. And we made some thing, and we, w Jacob, did all the work, of course. So went through this whole thing, and sure enough, when you compile it, it was like three times faster. Then you turn on compiler optimization. Same. So that was good because it meant it, it was the way the world should be. We should just, our job was just to write code that was flat enough and branch free enough that our friends across the street, in our case in the computer science department, could actually use their magic to do it. And so, because it's, anyway, so it was a good, it, it worked well. Okay. So this is what an input would look like. Um, and so these would be some things. These are, okay, I'll, I mean, I'll just, It'd give you some rough idea, but it would be, so these would be problems like a positioning problem, a support vector machine, and the, the numbers don't make any difference here, but the idea is, you know, here's a problem with a, hundreds of variables, and you can solve it in a tenth of a second using one of these parser solver type things, and you're like, that's, that's actually pretty good, uh, and it's not bad, right? Um, but then these things drop by, in that case, by factor of 50 or something like that, um, or in this case, it's, a, it's 500 or something with the factor. And by the way, that's, a, that's now in microseconds, right? So, um, so numbers don't matter. It, actually, what matters are the units there. You can solve like reasonably sophisticated, not gigantic, but small, you can in like microseconds, right? So, and for sure, this is gonna have an impact in a bunch of fields. I just don't know what it is, and it's, it's, it's kind of weird to me. Oh, and I should mention, we knew this was happening, but it was just announced like about a month ago. Um, so the SpaceX, the Falcon 9 landing, that people know what that is? Like the first, okay, yeah, so they, they actually announced, it, it just uses, actually, it's even worse than they use this method. They actually use CVXN generated code. So that's, exa that's, that's what it is. Just for, it's just actuator allocation. That's all they did. So 100 times a second, you have to put some forces and torques on the, uh, on, on the first stage it's landing. That comes from another system, and you got, uh, you got all sorts of control surfaces that they won't tell me what they are, but whatever they are, they just use a small generated thing, and it, that, that's what they do. So, okay. I, I could put a video of it here, but I, that, that's kind of, <laughs> that's a too weird. Okay, all right. So, you get, you can visualize it, it's fine. Uh, okay, so now we're at a, a, a I'm, I'm, as far as I can tell, I'm three minutes over. And, and we have an, an option here, and I, I'll, I'll need some guidance. Yeah, that's just you, but what about all these other people? <laughs> okay, that's fine. I don't care. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. All right, so we'll go 15 minutes over or something, like 10 minutes. I'll, I'll, do, I'll go over this very quickly, and then we'll have time for some questions. Okay. All right, fine. Fine. All right. What's that? No, 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 I don't know what happened. It was the, I, I don't know. I, I blame it on the, your introduction must have gone on for 20 minutes. I remember just, <laughs> yeah. And then the, and then we were interrupted by the fire marshal. That took some time. So, okay, fine. Yeah, okay, all right. So we're, switch, we're gonna switch, uh, we're gonna switch over and do uh, the opposite. So instead of solving a tiny problem, on, you know, obviously single thread on a small little thing. Oh, and by the way, for the embedded stuff, we, we run them on like arms and things like that. So it's kind of cool. Anyway, so, um, okay. So now we're gonna do the opposite and we're gonna go and solve like gigantic problems. Um, so, and I'm gonna resist 
the temptation to say big data, but okay, fine. So, okay. And so the idea is you use distributed optimization. Again, it's an idea this goes back so far. It goes back to the 40s minimum. And the idea is that you're going to split up a problem um, and then have different agents run different parts uh, separately. And then they can exchange messages and do this. And then hopefully they'll, they'll end up with the solution you would have had had you solved the whole problem, right? And the agents could be anything you like. They could be threads, devices, processes, whatever it is. I mean, it, doesn't, it could be all sorts of things. They could be separate things. Okay. Um, we'll look at um, a, a very simple, basic example. It's called consensus optimization. It looks like this. You want to minimize a, a function. You want to choose x to minimize this function. And it's a sum of, uh, of functions, right? And if you want to think of this in a machine learning thing, it's very easy. It's very actually very nice. You think of fi is the loss plus regularizer for the ith block of training data. So what you do is you have, you have a bunch of servers. Each one is sitting on top of whatever, hundreds of gigabytes or whatever of data. You would like to fit a model using all of that. And so one option is to collect all this data in one place and, and actually find a model, right? But in fact, here what you'll do instead is we want to solve this in a way that we all we're going to is, is each agent, whatever an agent is, is going to handle one of the FIs. So that's the idea. Okay. And so what you do is the first thing you do is you put it in a new form, which says, I'm going to let every agent have it, his own opinion, his or her own opinion here. And then you can say, however, they all have to agree. So this does not look like progress, right? But now you can put this in a form, um, and it's ready for a lot of different things. I mean, one is this thing called alternating directions method of multipliers, but there's a lot of other operators splitting methods. This is a whole thing now. People are doing this kind of stuff. Um, and the algorithm ends up looking like this. It's actually quite beautiful. It says this. If what you do is at, I at xi is the opinion of agent i of what x should be. And this superscript k means it's a kth iteration. So this average here is sort of like that, that would be the best guess of what x is at the kth iteration. You can't average all the opinions. Oh, by the way, uh, in convex optimization, when you average, you, uh, things go down. Uh, things get better, right? So in fact, in fact, that's actually the definition of, that's one definition of convexity, is if things get better under averaging, convex. Okay, so the algorithm works like this. This, the first stage is, is each agent entirely independently and in parallel. They minimize their private function, plus, and then this thing is simply something that's going to cause them all to go into consensus. And not only consensus, because it's easy to make them all agree. They could all just say zero. But the idea is they're going to go to consensus, and they're actually going to solve the original problem. So that's it. And basically, you're optimizing over xi. And it says, please don't deviate from uh, xk bar minus uik. uik is this mysterious variable that's going to drive them to consensus. But it turns out, here's the update. Uh, this, is, this is the amount by which agent i uh, differs from the collective wisdom of her peers, right? That's, that's this thing. And then this simply says that ui is the, that's an error, and this is the running sum of the errors. It says the ui is the old ui plus that. And in fact, so this is the running sum of the errors. This is, this is, PI con this is just PI control. So this is 120 years old. I mean, there is one difference, though. Uh, this algorithm here uh, actually converges, like always. This all, if f is convex and there's a solution to the original problem, this solves it, period. Now, if you look at the complexity theory, it's got the worst complexity theory there is, but it doesn't matter. So, but actually, it, it doesn't matter in a big way for a lot of reasons. But the point is, it just works, right? So there's no nonsense about F has to be differentiable or there's some technical, there are no technical conditions whatsoever. It just works always, right? It's also, in, it's kind of intuitive. Okay. Um, okay. So we're going to do a baby example. We're going to do support vector machine with... Uh, uh, oh, two features and 400 examples. I can solve that in around 50 microseconds on my laptop, right? Single thread. So, but it's just an example. And I'm going to do something evil. I'll take the groups. I'm going to split up the groups so that each sub, each agent gets 20 completely skewed things. Either they're, they're all positive or all negative, right? So, okay. This is the way it looks. I mean, these are on the first, these are the original classifiers. Of course, they're terrible because I, I intentionally gave each of these things a ter you know, terrible data. The black line is the end of the first iteration, which is that averaging. Um, actually, you can see this is Jensen's inequality. You can see that, that from all these terrible ones, you got something that was OK. You run ADMM like five, you know, five steps, and you get this. And then you run 40, and you get that. And that's the original thing. Now, the, the cool thing to think about here is this, is this was done. Uh, not one of these things has any clue how, what 
how many others there are or any. Each one supports the simplest possible protocol. It, in, I mean, it's unbelievably simple. It goes like this. Each of them simply does this. Uh, that's private and local. Uh, and this thing, they, they send their solution. And then what comes back is that thing. They update the state, which is UI, and they solve. Okay, so by the way, a, a full Python implementation of this with include, like using multiprocessing or whatever is actually fits on one slide. I don't have it here, but it's, it's spectacular, <laughs> right? You know, using CVXPy, right? So, I mean, it actually, it act, so it actually kind of just works. It's, uh, it's kind of cool. So, okay. Um, okay, so I will, uh, I'll wrap up and then we'll have time for some questions. Right? So, uh, the, the main point is, you know, these things come up in a lot of applications, right? So sometimes they come up immediately, just directly. Uh, sometimes some level of violence is needed to push your problem into this form. And once you've learned these tricks and tools, uh, these people are extremely effective, like at anything across multiple fields, right? So it's pretty good. Um, and the point is they can, you can solve them effectively. If it's a small problem, you can do this at microsecond times. Uh, medium scale is just using general purpose tools. So, and large scale ones using distributed optimization. Um, the software for these things, this is in okay shape. Uh, we're getting there on this. We're about to release some open source code generators. Um, and, uh, and for this, it's not quite there, but that's actually a goal. Would be to just have, well, something like multiprocessing, but just multi-optimization. In fact, you shouldn't even know. No, in fact, you shouldn't even know, right? It should. If you call the solve method for one of these things, this thing should figure out that you have 32 cores and do it right, or you have a GPU sitting off to the side. I mean, so anyway, um, that's not there yet, but we're hoping for that. Um, very, very important is this. You are not gonna be dragged into the mud of gradients and line searches. Uh, some people, I mean, that's fine. It's, that's like people who do, you know, uh, who write the back end of compilers or design the new generation of processors. We need those people, but not many of them. And in fact, <laughs> they, they should toil so that the rest of us can simply use what they designed or built. And it should be the exact same thing here, right? So, um, and that's a good thing. So actually, if you bump into someone who does those things, like I tell the students every, you know, like once a week, someone who, you know, lives in your dorm, go over to them and just thank them. <laughs> and just say, thank you. And they'd say, what the hell, why? And you say, oh, you know, for writing, working on the back end of compilers so that I can just type make. I mean, come on, that's, that's a good thing. Okay, so uh, I'll, I mean, this is silly. Uh, oh, I do wanna make one thing clear. I mean, any, if, you, if you type in anything vaguely related to the Google, you'll find resources. Um, but I, I do wanna make one thing very clear. So I, just, I just reported on the research of like, uh, not, if this is not me or my group, this is, I mean, some of it was, but most of it was just a 50 or 100 researchers across lots of fields. So don't, whatever you do, don't say your methods or something like that, because it's not. It's I just, it's an overview thing. So, okay, I'm gonna quit here. Um, Come on. Oh, come on. Ah, Charles. So you've seen this vein of automating the processes and the production. Yeah. And can you have a general purpose program that would do relax some of the core problems and do some simple stuff at a dramatic pace for that? So we kind of do. Uh, we're working on that. Um, but I mean, my, my feeling about that is that is that for a lot of these combinatorial problems in practical situations, you don't need to solve them to global optimality. Right, they're, they're commer I mean, Cplex want your know, IBM or whoever owns them now, they want you to think that you have to, but I don't believe it. So, so we're, yeah, we're working on things like that. Yeah, I don't know if they work or, but they, I mean, they do something. Oh no, CVX Gen generates uh, flat C code. Oh, okay. Yeah, CVX Pi um, takes your problem uh, and, and then compiles it or transforms it 
into a cone program and then called a, a C solver, single thread in that case. Right. Yeah, because there's all the Python overhead, and, and the solver actually is called cold, so it has to allocate memory. I mean, actually, it turns out that doesn't take much time, but yeah, just a lot of stuff happens. Yeah. Oh, and the solver, that solver is, is a generic solver. The CBX gen generated one uses the exact sparsity problem of your problem. And so it actually does a lot of weird stuff like the symbolic factorization. It does it, 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 does it while it's compiling. Yes. Yeah, so that's a good. Yeah, yeah. So, so we actually have a, a, a preliminary implementation in a, a, a TensorFlow uh, solver. Um, I mean, it kind of works, so that's, that's cool. Um, but we definitely, that's something we want to do. We want to seamlessly uh, have convex optimization in yeah, all these things, right? PyTorch, uh, TensorFlow, all of them, just so it just works. Um, but we want to do that, yeah. I actually think on that point, uh, I think, you know, our friends who do uh, neural networks have done an outstanding job of not just talking about things and doing it privately, you know, but also, like, you know, uh, making exquisite open source code that will actually, like, max out the resources on a GPU or multiple GPUs. I mean, so I, hats off to them. I would love to do that for optimization. I mean, it would be fantastic, right, so that no one even have to think about it. You know, you just you just install it, type in your problem, and boom, uh, you li you just light you just light up a whole bunch of uh, Amazon instances, and <laughs> you know, I mean that yes. So the answer is yeah. That's what, that's exactly what we want to do. By the way, I should say we, we're not that competent. So any peop there's people here probably who have are better at this than us. So please help. This is open source. So you know, please. Okay. Okay. Good, good. good. Sure. Oh. Oh. Outside of question. Yeah. So, um, how do you feel like uh, with the machine learning and the common sense optimization, can mm -hmm. it the same feel like it's the same? No, 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 no. no. I, I would say not, no. Because in, 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 in machine learning, you'll, you'll look at a lot of other different things. O only some of the stuff in machine learning is convex. Only some. Okay. Right? And uh, vice versa, in convex optimization, I mean, one of the things we do is machine learning. But actually, uh, we do a lot of other things, which are not machine learning. Do so you go to regularly go to like machine learning conferences? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. But I also I go to other weird things. I go to conferences that do radar or finance, or check out a lot of things. Okay. Not regularly, but you know. Okay, okay. what do you consider like the, any, like, high, any development you want, like uh, optimizing, uh, complex optimizing your field might be kind of somehow very easy to be applied to machine learning problems? Well, it depends which problems, right? Okay. So the, the truth is for the, the convex machine learning things that people already solve, okay. like support vector machine logistic regression, right, right. all the, these things, they're, they're really extremely good right now. I mean, they're very, very good, right? Like in R, they have these things that work. Things like, I guess, it's called Litna. It's called, uh, what is it? what's the R thing? Glimnet is like, it's fine, right? Uh, LibSVM. I mean, you're not going to, you know. Now, if you want to prototype and do something that no one's ever solved before, this is what you use. Yeah, for sure. Right, so actually, yeah, my, all my colleagues in statistics use these things to, to prototype things. And yeah, and then when they decide this is what they really want to do, then they figure out a, a, a fancy implementation. And then in their case, they usually connect it to R. But that's another thing. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's good. Hey, this is uh, good. Oh, okay, what's your name? Will. Will, okay. Yeah, there you I'm go. In the office, I figured. Okay, well, I sure. Why not? Yeah, thank you very much. Why not? Much. Sure, sure. Good. Oh, a quick question. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you think about convex analysis? 